Hey friends, I'm really excited to have a chance to work with you one more time again this year. And um, the last time we saw each other, we were learning about how water could change how the land looks. Well, um, that is an example of how something that's non-living um, can change the earth, can change the landscape. And today what I want to look at with you is how can living things change what the earth looks like. One example is termites. This here is a picture of a termite mound. And these are basically like forever evolving cities. They're made out of soil, saliva, and dung. They're full of tunnels that along with being passageways for the termites also bring fresh air in which circulates throughout this whole city. And then it exits through the top, which is a chimney. Another type of organism that can change the earth is a tree. The roots of a tree can grow down, um, around, into the cracks of rocks, can force the rocks apart. Um, the weathered pieces of the rocks can then be more easily eroded and moved around by water or wind. When something that's living, like a tree or a termite or a groundhog, or even a human changes the environment, it's called biogeology. One of the most skilled animals actually at changing the environment lives right here in Vermont. I'm gonna give you a few clues. Uh, it's a mammal, it's, it stays in Vermont and it stays active in Vermont all year round. It has um, large uh, webbed rear feet, has small front paws, has a big flat tail. Have you guessed it yet? Um, it has orange front teeth, really good for chopping down trees. You got it. That is our beaver. The beaver is considered to be one of nature's greatest engineers. So this afternoon what I want to do is take a hike out into the woods to a beaver pond that I know about. Um, with my friend Patty, who I'll introduce you to. I'm hoping that we'll find a beaver that I know named Henry um, along the way. Even if we don't actually see the beaver, what I really want you to be able to see is what the environment around a beaver pond looks like and consider how this organism, the beaver, has impacted this land and made lasting changes on this landscape. Um, before we head out, let's just take a moment to think about what we might see. What are some examples of the beaver's impact on the land that we might hope to see while we're out there? Think about that for just a moment. Some of the things that I'm thinking about are the beaver dam, hopefully we'll see that. Um, I'm thinking about the beaver pond. I am also wondering if we might see some downed or some gnawed trees. Something else that I'm thinking about is how this new environment that the beaver has created will attract different animals. So I'm wondering if we might actually see some other animals or at least some signs of some other animals. And a few of the ones that are coming to mind for me off the top of my head include the wood duck. Um, a wood duck depends on tree cavities near ponds to build their nests and that's also where they raise their young. So that would be a really cool thing to see. I'm also wondering if we might see moose or signs of moose. They like the brushy habitat of a beaver pond area and the shallow water that it creates. Uh, let's see, another one that I'm thinking we might see a sign of, or I hope it would be a likely one, would be a woodpecker. Uh, specifically in my mind, I'm thinking about a pileated woodpecker. Um, woodpeckers like dead trees and downed wood. Okay, let's head out and see what we can find. Hey friends, so here we are. We made it to the beaver pond. It was a little bit of a hike. I have some friends to introduce you to. It's my friend Patty, who I work with at Beak, and she is a wildlife rehabilitator. So she actually knows a lot of the animals, the wild animals around here. 
and we're sitting here tonight with one of her beaver friends, Henry, which is just who we were hoping to meet. So um, this is the first introduction this, of these two. This is the first introduction um, of the night before we jump into the whole idea of biogeology and how organisms, how living things, plants or animals, um, can change the landscape. But why don't we start off, Patty, with you just telling us a little bit about, about Henry, and then we'll learn about what, um, what he's done, how he's impacted the land around us. Oh, let's see. Henry, what shall I say about you? I have known this particular beaver for about four years, and he is up on the shore tonight to show you some of the great adaptations he has that help him to alter the landscape to meet his needs. Henry can't live without water. He's obviously a little bit ungainly on the land, um, but boy, in the water, he can float and swim. And I don't know if you can see it from the, oh, he's gonna show you now. He's got great claws on those front paws for digging and moving mud and rocks. And you all know the beavers can cut down trees with their teeth. They also use their teeth to strip the bark off twigs and sticks like this, and that's what they eat all winter long. And then they use the leftovers to build their dams, and that's why you guys are here today, to find out about Henry's great dam building skills. He's gonna do a little demonstration over there right now, I think. Hey, so Patty, I was noticing the dam over here, and as I think about the impact that animals can have on the landscape, how they can change the landscape, um, this is a really unusual looking dam to me. Um, is this an old dam? This is a very old dam. Many generations of beavers have lived here before and started this dam and built it up and then it's washed away and they build it up again. There is a section of new dam over mm -hmm. there that they've been working on this spring that's made this pond. When I first came here 13 years ago, this was a meadow. And wow. With, now, did this meadow have a stream running through it? Just a little stream. A little trickle. Yep. Wow. And so, um, friends, if you can notice on that dam there that, um, that Patty's referring to, it's not just sticks. The older part of it is actually land now. It just looks like the side, the bank of a, of a pond or of a lake. And the newer part is what we often think of more when we think of a beaver's dam. It's fresher sticks and mud. <laughs> what do you do when you try to dam a stream? I, um, I take some of Earth's materials. I take sand and soil and rocks and I pile them up there. I mostly use my hands, maybe a little shovel. Yep. How about you? That's what I do. And what about Henry? Sometimes I think I'll be a big help and help the beavers build their dams. Uh -huh. And what I do is I grab great big logs and I lay them crosswise across the flowing water. And then I notice that that's not what beavers do at all. And so when you take a look at a beaver dam, you'll see that they're just dropping big sticks in the direction of the current, and they stick into the stream mm. bed on the other side and make kind of a stockade of logs. And then they pile up mud and rocks on the inside. So try that next time. Ah, uh, that's a good tip. So it's more like building a barricade yeah. and then filling it in. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so besides the dam, Besides taking this meadow um, that had a trickle of a stream coming through it and changing it to look like this, you know, this amazing woodland pond with a lot of snags in it 
and a lot of um, smaller vegetation as well. I'm wondering how else the beaver changes the landscape. Well, one of the things that's important about beavers is not only do they create dams and ponds, but they only live here for a little while and then they go away. So the dam eventually breaks down and the water starts flowing again <clears throat> and you're left with an open meadow. And then eventually trees and shrubs start to grow up mm -hmm. again and then the beavers come back and eat the trees and shrubs. And if this goes on often enough, you'll also see all this mud and silt building up in the bottom of the pool. And pretty soon, the only things that really can grow here are these big spongy mosses that just soak up water. <laughs> what we're standing on. What we're standing on here, yeah. this great big sponge. And forests really can't return here. This will stay a wetland as long as the beavers keep coming and going. Uh-huh. So, here in this forest, along this little brook, instead of just having woods, 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 where this little brook flows and there are beavers. Yeah. We now have ponds and meadows and wetlands and shrublands and just so many different types of habitats that would not exist without our friend Henry. So here's my next question then. If this habitat is changing so much and it's becoming more of a wetland and less of a forest, and so the water is dispersed over a wider area, it's not just moving through the land, um, how does that affect the land, having it be um, a wider, flatter area of water? Um, oh, it affects it in so many ways. Okay. By slowing the water and stopping it, it allows the sunlight to shine down through the water and warm it up, and that gets all kinds of little microorganisms very excited and happy, and it really feeds the whole food chain for the brook, so you end up with Oh, very happy frogs and salamanders and fish. Um, also, it allows the water to percolate down into the soil and actually increases the amount of water in the soil. Wow. And um, so it increases the amount of water in the soil. And I'm wondering as it's percolating down, what that's making me think of is like a filter system. So is there any kind of filtration that's happening here? Oh. Can you explain that to us? Absolutely. Well, as soon as the water slows down, as it's flowing down the stream, carrying little bits of silt and debris, when it hits the still water of the pond, all that stuff just settles to the bottom. So the water that flows out of the pond is going to look cleaner. There are also clays and things in the pond bottom that can bind to toxic chemicals and help clean the water that way. Don't wow. ask me to explain it, but that's what I'm told. Okay, well, we'll come back for that, for that version. Hey, I have one other question that I'm thinking about. Um, I'm thinking about when you said that as the environment changed, there were new microorganisms, and that those microorganisms that were down in the water were appealing to amphibians and to some fish. Yeah. And I'm wondering about other kinds of animals. As this habitat has changed, how have, how, you know, how has the diversity of species changed here as well? Well, if you look around right here, all of these plants are plants that like to have their feet wet. Mm -hmm. So these are not plants you're going to find just out in the dry, shady woods. These are, these are wetland plants, so automatically we have a great diversity of plants you're not going to find elsewhere. And of course, there are all kinds of animals that only like to live in ponds. We've got green frogs and bullfrogs and newts. The fish love it. We have kingfishers that come in mm. and herons and ducks and geese, all these things that really depend on ponds. However, it's also true that almost every other animal that lives in the forest comes down to this pond and down to wetlands for to meet needs during their life cycle. Bears will come here first thing in the spring because this is the place that greens up first. Um, bobcats come here to hunt all the happy little rodents that like to live in, in these open meadows. Oh my goodness. Moose, of course, love to come here and 
eat all the nice green stuff that grows in the summer and to cool off. And to cool off. And um, I'm feeling like being here and having these trees around here and this shrubbery makes it feel like kind of a protected area. And I think of moose in that kind of habitat. Is that is that yes. accurate? Yes. Well, that is accurate. And also, it's, it's protected by all the coniferous trees around the edge, but it's also a good place for the bull moose to show off in the fall. So you'll mm. often find them in these wetlands because the cows can see them from some distance and admire them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, hey, this might seem like a really obvious question, but because this is water, I would imagine that any animal would come here because water is a need that we all share. Yes. So I could imagine deer coming and raccoons coming. Oh yeah. Even though they're not necessarily going to want to go swimming in here the way the, <laughs> the green frog is, they would come here for a drink. Oh my gosh, the raccoons are here all the time. <clears throat> they like to hunt those frogs. Mm -hmm. Great. Little washer bears. Mm -hmm. What about um, thinking Ooh. about some other animals that otter. might like living in there? That's exactly what otter, I was otter. otter. And what about mink? And mink. Mm -hmm. Mink love it here. So these are some animals that, some of them that we're talking about that perhaps had been part of this forest landscape before visiting that, but some definitely not. Right. Um, some of the ones that really require the water um, as their as their place, place to be. Um, so it's not just that we've replaced the animals, but we have increased the diversity because the animals that like to live in the forest are still there and they can come here and visit but there are animals that completely depend on an aquatic environment that really yes. couldn't have been here before. Exactly. Is that right? That's right. Wow. So lots of changes. Lots of changes. So 50 years ago, there weren't any beavers in this part of Vermont at all. And this was all forest, but they were reintroduced to their old habitat. And so when they came back in and built dams, they flooded that forest. And what we have left here are standing dead trees, which make amazing nesting sites for all kinds of birds and woodpeckers love it the, the kingfishers are often perched on those snags and diving into the water to catch the fish and uh, sadly this is this is a habitat that we're going to see disappear over the next 50 years as the beavers have created ponds everywhere and all of that standing forest is just disappears and replaced by permanent wetlands but right now Certainly the, the birds can enjoy these standing dead trees. See how full of holes they are. This particular spot um, is a great example of where you can see all of these dead stumps that were once trees that were once part of this forest and are now part of this wetland in the midst of this forest. So when we're thinking about biogeology, here is an excellent image of how this landscape has been altered by an organism. Hey friends, check this out. We have not seen any other animals other than Henry but we definitely are seeing signs of some of the animals we talked about. Any idea who's been here? Uh, hey friends, listen to that. Again, an animal that we're not actually seeing out here, but one that we're hearing this time. So a sign of another animal that is making use of this new habitat created by the beaver. So that sound that you're hearing is a frog. It's a really small frog called the spring peeper. Oh, looks like some old coyote scat. Coyotes love to visit beaver wetlands. There are usually all kinds of little critters to eat there. Not sure what that fur is. Any ideas, Patty? Well, yeah, it almost looks like snowshoe hair. And uh, yes. Not beaver. Not beaver. Thank goodness. Hey friends, um, I'm so glad we were able to get out here to this beaver pond tonight and that our friend Patty, who's such an expert um, on beavers and their habitats, was able to join us for part of it. And I hope that after this experience you have a better idea of what I'm talking about when I say biogeology. 
um, how living things um, can impact and change the landscape, change their environment. And tonight, not only did we get to see the beaver, but we did get to see a few other animals, which was exciting, and signs of some animals. One of the things we hadn't talked about was all of the sounds that we've been hearing tonight as well. So maybe some of those were familiar to you. Maybe you were hearing um, the chickadee um, or the blue jay. Um, maybe there were some animals that were making sounds that the animals, if you saw them, would be familiar to you, but you didn't know them by their sounds. Um, we were hearing a red squirrel. We were hearing a chipmunk. We were hearing a nuthatch, um, a white-throated sparrow. Anyways, there were a lot of those, and maybe some that would have been brand new. Maybe you didn't know um, the sound of the pileated woodpecker, but we were hearing that one as well. So maybe you want to do a rewind and hear some of this again, watch some of it, and do some closer listening. And um, I hope you get out and do an explore in your backyard or in your neighborhood and see what signs you can discover of how the landscape where you are has changed because of the impact of different animals. Um, good luck on your adventures, and um, it's been great working with you. Take care. If you have enjoyed this video, please visit our website to learn more about what we do and consider making a donation.